I'm just going over to, to Patrick. Uh, and heroes you've met, Patrick, uh, I know there are many. Uh, can you just think of, well, you met Art God Funk. What about Dylan and Nick Drake and all these people? No, um, emphatically not. Uh, Bob, that shoulder was the one he brushed against. That's the closest I got to Bob. <laughs> Nick Drake is currently dead. That's tricky. I was very pleased uh, to spend time with my old friend Paul McCartney. Um, we go back a long way. I knew him before he was knighted, so it's a, a strong relationship. And um, <laughs> he, um, he, he was very reluctant to always talk about the group he was in before Wings, because that's all anybody ever wanted to talk to him about. But we were down at his home studio one day doing an interview and he'd been on Bob Hope and he was just, um, he was just very chatty about the Beatles. I used to have those John type glasses, the, the national health ones. and. Uh, Something about the glass, and he just started talking about working with John and everything. And it was fantastic. You know, you you pinch yourself. You, you he's talking about um, writing "Hey Jude," and and you think this is Paul McCartney. And um, on the way out, there was this double bass in the corner, uh, and I said, "That's very nice." And he said, "Yeah, yeah." He said, "Linda bought it for me. It's um, it's a double bass that uh, Bill Black played on Heartbreak Hotel," and I went, "Yeah." And he picked it up and he started playing Heartbreak Hotel on yeah. Bill Black's double. And I thought, actually, it doesn't get much better than that. Well, do you know what? I'm going to, I went to the studio as well and he'd done the same. He said he's so proud of the uh, bass. Yes. I played, yeah. on, uh, I played on Flowers in the Dirt session. Uh -huh. And um, he called me down uh, at Peas Marsh. So I get down there. And John was his roadie then uh, and guitar tech. Mm. And when I went in there, they were doing up, there's a windmill there and they had scaffolding <laughs> at, at the windmill. And, and Paul said, that. I said, what are you doing there? He said, oh, Linda, we're putting the windmill back together again so she can uh, make some bread. I said, Paul, Tesco's is only down the road. Like yeah, there are so many funny stories, aren't they? I used he was to talking about some um, songwriting and he, he said, uh, well, you've written books on Dylan and Springsteen and, you know, they're, they're great at lyrics. He said, I really struggle with with lyrics. Um, he said, I could go to that piano and come out with a dozen melodies that I'd be very happy with, but I'd be really struggling with lyrics. But I, I heard myself on the tape say, well, actually, Paul, if you think about it, yesterday is a pretty good combination of lyrics and melody. Uh, when you discovered it's the most popular song in the history of recorded music with over 3,000 cover versions. And there's me saying to him, no, don't give up the day job, Paul. You know, you stick with it. <laughs> That's a different view, view of uh, meeting heroes. Um, I happened to, be, I was at an old university reunion and talking to my old professor, Professor Roger Blind Stoyle. Mercifully, he couldn't remember me at all. He didn't know what a shit scientist I was. <laughs> but we, I was telling him, about meeting Jacko Pastorius, the bass player. I'd been on tour all over, all over Europe with Cliff Richard, of all people. We kept crossing paths with Weather Report. And I thought it's going to be great to meet somehow. And it did happen. We met in a hotel. Unfortunately, Jacko was out of his head. And he, he told me all about his laundry. So <laughs> it wasn't great. So I come back to this meeting, and I told my professor this. And he told me about his meeting with his hero, which was Richard Feynman. Does anyone know that name? Eminent physicist. He was in part of the Los Alamos project for the atomic bomb. So eminent guy. So he met this man and he wanted to talk to him about particle physics and anything, you know, real serious stuff. Now Feynman was a, a lover of life. He used to take part in street parades and play congas and he loved women. He was, he was not the archetypal type of scientist. So my guy said to him, um, can we talk about particle physics? And he said, hey man, I've just seen this beautiful blonde. He pushed him out of the way. It's great. <laughs> no, no, you've just mentioned Cliff Richard. It reminded me of a story about Cliff and Paul McCartney. I was working on the, again, I think I mentioned earlier, the, the um, Golden Jubilee concert at Buckingham sure. Palace, where they assembled you know, the great and the good of, of British music. And uh, Cliff Richard was on. I think the idea was to sort of celebrate all the great um, hits across the 50 years as it was in the Queen's reign. So they had Cliff on doing Move It, they had McCartney closing the show, Rod Stewart, people like that. And um, and I was looking after uh, Cliff, making sure he was all right. And, and as I'm sure you know, Cliff can be a little bit of an old woman and he does fuss. Surely not. And he was fussing around about this, that and the other. And oh, what about this? What about that? Oh, no, I can't. My mic pack won't click on. And this is. And what about if you? Know, and where's the nearest toilet? And how? 
and it was just it was, it was, I was run ragged. And every time I walked through, there was a sort of central green room area. People like McCartney and Rod Stewart and Tom Jones and all the knights of rock uh, were, were lounging around. And it was on the day that I think the World Cup was on, bizarrely, and the England were playing. So they were all gathered. That's the reason they weren't in their dressing rooms. They were sort of gathered around watching the TV. I remember Roger Taylor from Queen was kind of, um, they couldn't get a decent signal despite it being a BBC production. And he was literally <laughs> stuck a coat hanger in the back of the telly and was on a chair trying to get, trying to get the picture. Um, but every time I came running through, I must've looked pretty ragged. And, and, um, and it was just bizarre because all these great heroic, legendary figures of rock get yeah, sure. over to check sure. if I was okay. And McCartney <laughs> came over and said, are you all right? Are you okay? He's, How's Cliff? We're, we're all very worried about you. <laughs> you. All right, you sure? And every time I walk past him, go, is Cliff all right? Said, yes. <laughs> and then, and then Rod Stewart came over. He said, "What? What? What are you talking about?" And he said, "The lad here, Cliff. Cliff's running him ragged." <laughs> and Rod Stewart goes, "Oh, the Devil Woman. Oh, I'll take no notice of him." You know, <laughs> just hysterical. Um, and by the end of the I day, I got a call from him about fifteen years ago. He wanted to remake Move It in the same studio, in the same spot. And he got, I appeared on the list. Brian Bennett was on drums. And taking the only sheer lead guitar part was Brian May. So, so we assembled in Studio Two. And we, we, he wanted to do a kind of more groovy, swampy, Bonamassa kind of version. And Brian May was about an hour late for this session. And we wondered where he was. He finally turns up looking very ragged. The hair was a bit more distressed than usual. He looked very tired. And after a bit of prodding, he, he explained and apologised. He said, I'm so sorry. But the, the, this excuse he gave cannot be topped. This is the best ever excuse. <clears throat> he said, I'm sorry, that I've been up all night with Patrick Moore, proofreading a book we've co-written on the history of the universe. <laughs> <laughs> Meet, meeting uh, heroes, um, McCartney... Uh, <laughs> said that when they got to see Elvis, the only time they ever got to see him, it was, I think it's the anniversary of the meeting when I interviewed him. And um, he said, we were saying, John was literally shaking at the prospect of, of meeting Elvis. And I said, what, what are your memories of that, of that encounter? Uh, and, and he said, oh, we loved Elvis. You know, he said, we, we all loved Elvis. He said, uh, uh, but we, was, we were so nervous. Uh, he said, what I do remember is going in, um, and Elvis had his arm around a, a blonde and a, and a brunette, as, as he would. And uh, we, we walked in and he stood up and he turned the television off with a, with a remote control device. Uh -huh. And so I was waiting for the rest of the story when the world's most influential rock and roll band met the king of rock and roll. And I said, is that it? And he said, well, it's pretty fucking cool for 1965, he said. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Uh, just, just, just a hero of mine was Eric Clapton. Uh, way back in the 80s, I did a, a, a sort of a, a war zone kids show called uh, Knock Your Block Off. And uh, it was just it was quite anarchic at the time. Um, but what was weird is that a lot of the rock giants, Gilmore uh, and uh, Clapton and all these people who I sort of work with now and again, well, I'd never met Clapton, but Gilmore certainly... Uh, and others, uh, Ringo Starr and stuff, they, well, their, their offspring or their friends, younger friends, used to watch the show. So therefore, they knew the show by default because the kids would talk about it. This is 1987 or whatever. And I'm going to do Kenny Jones, I think, name drop of the Who, a, a polo thing, you know, that sport with a hole in the middle. And uh, so he had a polo thing going. And I was there. And I was coming out of the tent and lo and behold, just like something out of a, a sort of a, a, some sort of the Sir Lancelot sort of early sort of thing, we both came out together. It was very odd. And as we sort of, we went like that and then converged together. And he looked at me and I looked at him. And I said, Steve Blacknell, knock your block off. <laughs> and he looked at me and said, Eric Clapton, cream, and walked off. <laughs> Ha, 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 ha.